Hello, good morning, and I welcome you all in our today's session. In our today's lecture, we will be talking about translation theory before the 20th century, and this is going to be our second part of the discussion. So this is the continuation of our previous lecture, that is translation theory before the 20th century. So uh, if I ask you the question before I jump to the discussion, so uh, what was your understanding or what so far actually have understood from the previous discussion, I mean, especially about the transition theory, your experience or your, uh, I mean, or what actually so far you have understood? Uh, do you really think that it's very important to know these theories to understand translation? So what is your perspective? So uh, my perspective is that when we translate uh, source language to target language, uh, we, uh, we should concern on sense, sense for sense translation, not word for word. Okay. If we translate, mm -hmm. uh, go on, go on. If we translate into word for word translation, then it uh, might uh, uh, it might be crime. It might be uh, it might be poses some another meaning. Okay. Not exactly the writer want to say. Okay, that means writer's intention or intended meaning that might lose if we go for the word for word translation. So we should go for sense for sense translation. Okay, any, uh, any other opinion? Any other opinion? Thank you, Ritu. Fine. So what's your opinion about it? Uh, sir, what for what uh, translation uh, in what for what translation we cannot express uh, the always in the, the main meaning mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but since first since uh, <coughs> translation we can easily uh, translate uh, the meaning from a source language to target language um, okay so in bible it... is okay, important mm -hmm. yes sir. So, uh, because because if we uh, change uh, word to word uh, there uh, is not um, the accurate uh, translation so we can also use word to word and also sense for sense so we can keep keep the both right right sir Okay, so uh, you you want to say that we can go for the word for word, and at the same time also we can go for the sense for sense. So the combination of both, right? Yes, sir. Okay, that's great. Now right. we can we can jump to the next slide, the first slide of our today's discussion. So let's see what we have here. Now here you see early attempts at systematic translation theory by Dryden, Dolet, and uh, Tatler. Now let's see for Amos, the England of the seventeenth century with Denham. Cowley and Dryden, you know, we are talking about John Dryden. I hope, uh, I believe that you have heard the name. He is a very famous poet. Uh, marked an important step forward in translation theory with deliberate, reasoned statements unmistakable in their purpose and meaning. At that time, translation into English was almost exclusively confined to verse renderings of Greek and Latin classics, some of which were extremely free. Cowley, for instance, in his preface to Pendrick Odes, which was published in 1640, attacks poetry that, that is converted faithfully and word for word into French or Italian prose. So you see, they're also talking about these poets, also they try to follow the trends or the, you can see the poetic uh, structure uh, from Italy and also the, I mean, the, from the French writers and also the Italian uh, writers. So they had a different opinion about translation theory. Now in the next slide, let's see what they're saying. His approach is also to counter the inevitable loss of beauty in translation by using our wheat or invention to create new beauty. In doing so, Carl admits he has taken, left out and added what I please to the odes. So Carl actually, he says that if you go for sense for sense, uh, instead of word for word. So sometimes we take the levati and we feel very free. Then what happens in that case? That he has taken, left out and added what I please. 
So uh, you can see you will invest, invent something, there will be an invention, and you will use your wheat because you want to create something new. And when you want to do that kind of stuff, then, then you will feel that you have left some of the, I mean, the, left some of the, uh, I mean, the statistics features or maybe some uh, exact meaning of the authentic text or the source text. So Cowley even proposes the term imitation for this very free method of translation, translating. So he's, he's calling this imitation. Okay, the idea was not as in the Roman period that such as free method would enable the translator to surprise the original, rather that this was the method that permitted the spirit of the source text to be best reproduced. So here actually you can see it's a little bit conflicting and uh, to some extent contradictory. So he says that the idea was not, he's calling this kind of translation imitation, okay? And as in the Roman period, that such a free method would enable the translator to surpass the original. He says that if you take that kind of free method, that means sense for sense translation, and if you don't follow the um, in exact rule of translation, that means word for word translation, then in that case, sometimes maybe the translator, he will surpass the original, that means the original author. Rather, that this was the method that permitted the spirit. He says that it will permit the spirit of the source text to be best to produce. So if you go that kind of sense for sense translation, he's saying that that means the spirit, that means something new that will be reproduced. So you can surpass the original and at the same time also you can produce something new and that is the spirit, something new you can infuse into that original text. I mean while actually you will go for the translation. Now such a very free approach to translation produced a reaction, notably from another English poet and translator, John Dryden, whose, belief, whose brief description of the translation process would have enormous impact on subsequent translation theory and practice. Now, uh, we have seen that, uh, I can go back. So you see Amos, uh, or you can see the Cowley, he is supporting that the free translation, you can use it. But on the other hand, we can see that Dryden actually, John Dryden, he didn't support it. He said that this kind of translation actually, it, it can harm the translation process and also it can disturb the meaning. So what is he saying? He's saying that such a very free approach to translation produced a reaction, notably from another English poet and translator, John Dryden. You see Cowley himself, he was also a poet and John Dryden, he was also a very famous poet. Uh, English poet. So now these two English poets, so one is for free translation and another is for what for what translation or uh, I mean he asks for a kind of allegiance or fidelity to the original text. Now here you see process, uh, pro uh, process would have enormous impact on subsequent translation theory and practice. So he, his idea of translation, it has uh, left some impact on the subsequent translation theory and practice. Now, in the preface to his uh, translation of Ovid's episode, in 1680, Dryden reduces all translation to three categories. So you see, John Dryden actually, he has categorized, or he categorized translation into three different categories. And these three different categories, actually those are, you can see the foundation of the classification of translation. And later on, we have more advancement on translation, but this is the basis. Uh, in our introductory discussion about translation studies, we have already come to know, and I have already discussed this, that is uh, metaphrase, paraphrase. I hope you know these two uh, types of translation. Now here we have another one that is new, we call it imitation. Okay, now here actually we'll have a very brief uh, definition and that will be enough for us to understand it, that what is metaphrase. You know, metaphrase means word by word and line by line translation which corresponds to literal translation okay so john dryden he says that that we can we, actually he has classified translation into these three categories so the first one is metaphrase that is word by word and line by line translation which corresponds to literal translation that means we can call it literal translation in bengali we call it akkuri onuvad or that potita shabdo line by line onuvad kora sheta hoche metaphrase original text jemon ache Take our translation, I mean, the target text, the language, word by word, 
main block. So we call this kind of translation literal translation. Now the second type that he mentioned that is paraphrase. Now his definition of paraphrase is translation with latitude where the author is kept in view by the translator so as never to be lost, but his words are not so strictly followed as his sense. These involves changing whole phrases and more or less corresponds to faithful or sense for sense translation. So paraphrase is sense for sense translation. That means he will uh, keep in mind the author's intention or his intended meaning, but he will not go for the literal translation. Rather, he will take the sense and exactly he will translate that sense into the target language. I hope you understand it, right? The paraphrase? That's it. Okay, that is sense for sense translation. Now the third, this is the new one that we have got, that is imitation. Now forsaking both words and sense, this corresponds to Cowley's very free translation and is more or less adaptation. So what is imitation actually? We can call it adaptation. The another name for imitation, we can call it adaptation. Do you, do you follow me what I'm saying, dear students? Adaptation, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, what do you mean by adaptation? Adaptation means we take a text from any source language, source text, it can be English or French, if, if I can speak French language, then I'll take a text, and then I'll not translate exactly, what I'll do, I'll read the whole story of the whole novel, and then I will write it in my own words. The story is same, but my approach is different. It's not exactly the translation. I have just, uh, I mean, I mean, what should I say? I have just picked some ideas. I have picked the storyline from your story, from your novel, and then I wrote it in my own words. That is adaptation. What are Kono translation notion? Just put a poor idea in a show, Ruja, Yaki Golpo Niger Vashel. Got it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That is what we call imitation. Man, Onu Koron Kora. Arecta Golpo, Onu Koron, Amra Shay, Amra Kori Shadato, Puma, Jubi TV, the Dekata, especially on television, you will find that there are lots of adaptation. So, not exactly the, I mean, uh, the exact translation or translation, I mean, translated piece of work. It is not. I mean, shown as a piece of work on television. Uh, because the reason is that, for example, if I take a drama from Russian language, and if I translate it into Bangla, and if I try to showcase that play on a stage, just you tell me, how many people will understand that? Because that is a completely Russian context, Russian names, Russian lifestyle, Russian trend, Russian cultural, uh, cultural norms and rites and rituals, those are used. And generally, we are not that much familiar with this kind of, uh, I mean, this kind of society, their social background. If you don't know it, then what will happen? That when we'll be watching that play on, uh, on the stage, most, in most cases, we'll not be able to find the reference, uh, I mean, for reference of that context to our life. Understood what I'm saying? Amra Judi Koroakta Amonakta Puribeshir Thike by Amonakta Bhasha at a language thike at a text of Ranila. I can she takes a Kunuvat Kuru who she takes a Monjan Kutsi. Amra Monjaji Shinat Kutsi. Kojun Lok Ashulashi Namir or Tho Jain Amra Namguluki, Kotin Kotin Namashe, or their social life is structured or different. Jagula Shatama the mill name. Jagan Nam Jugula Babar Korot Shigolo Jutamra Chinese Jonam interrelate Korajit Kabaraji. You will try to find a kind of relationship to, I mean, a kind of, I mean, a relationship to your own experience. Now, uh, when actually, usually what we do, any literary piece, and if it is, I mean, uh, especially plays, if they're shown on television, plays or drama, then usually what we do on a stage or even as an audience or even on in front of the television, what do you see? then usually when we watch anything, we always try to use our experience to understand it, right? Amra nijidhe robik gota gulo bhaabhaar pere no ojini shta bhujbar junno? Na ki jas dekhe hi jai ki sui bujhe nai, rukum ki hai? No, sir. 
नायक नायिक नाम जी सर ओके ब्रदर सो इट्स क्लियर अप टू दिस ए बजो तो परिष्कार तो मागे तो रिसला जी सर ओके फैंटास्टिक फैंटास्टिक इफ यू डोंट अंडरस्टैंड एनीथिंग प्लीज लेट मी नो ओके रिसला हां हां जी सर बुझते सी ओके दैट्स ग्रेट जी सर असम जी सर ओके तंजीर आर यू विद अस तंजीर तंजीर नाइस सर तुषार जी Is Tushar with us? Two sir, nine sir. Tushar, is Tushar with us? Tushar, nine sir. No sir, Tushar and Tanjir is absent. Okay, please talk to them, okay? Because they 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 were also absent in my last lecture, and I think they are doing it with all the lectures, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, they are yes, very very regular. Okay, we will address it later. Now, now let's concentrate on this. Now here. Dryden criticizes translators such as Ben Jonson. So you know Ben Jonson, another playwright, and also uh, I mean he's a famous writer. So you see, he also criticizes Ben Jonson, who adopts metaphrase as being a verbal copier. Such verbal literal translation is dismissed with a new, with a now famous simile. It is much like dancing on ropes with fettered legs, a foolish task. Uh, I don't know whether I actually have got it. But I will make it simple for you. Can I say that Dryden actually he didn't like this word for word translation? Okay, John Dryden didn't like the idea of translating, and that is word for word translation. He didn't like it. Understood? Yes, sir. But you see, yes, another, sir. but you see another famous playwright, Ben Jonson. He did it. Actually, he adopts metaphrase. And that's why Dryden he is calling him verbal copier. What is he calling him? Ben Johnson. Dryden Ben Johnson के वजह से हुबु copy. Verbal copy. शे हुबु आखिर बारे original text से जावो ना तो English जितने उन्नत प्रवासों में आखिर रखो मार्क्स. At the word by word translation थे निकाल. ठीक है तो word for word translation. So that's why actually he is calling him that he is a verbal copier. कारण वोटा शुद्ध मतलब शब्द देर हुबु हु उन्नत करा होता है. Then he goes farther by saying this such survival. And lit literal translation is dismissed with a now famous simile. Then he said, "Okay, keep up with dismiss." Correct? Then, if any translation that is important to correct, then the translator will use a different word. Correct? Understood? So, it is a very important word. Saval means that you are a human being, not a servant. So, what are, actually, I am I am becoming a slave to the original text when I go for word for word translation. Do you get the idea? What I am saying? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you cannot be a slave to the original text. That means if you go for the word for word, then actually there is the danger. You might lose uh, some senses. You might lose some meaning, and also the intended meaning of the author. I mean, while translating. Now oh, that's actually his. His. Uh, I mean, John Dryden. He doesn't support this literal or uh, uh, word for word translation, and he has given this simile. That is, it is much like dancing on ropes with feet at legs. A foolish task. If a fit at legs means, uh, for example, ropes are very. Uh, I mean, you know, it's very dangerous, and it's it needs a special special kind of skill or expertise uh, if you really want to dance on the rope, right? Do you yes. do you get the what I'm saying? Can we dance on the ropes? Usually, do we dance on the ropes? No. Would the character shoot or jump? Say, even that, or would it be manush ke? एंटरटेन 
if you really want to do so. But if I, uh, I mean, put, if I put your legs in chains, Judy Tomar Payami string called Vedidi, Talika Aru Parajabe? Nasa Aru Kutin Hajabana? Tuni will send what for a translation art Erukumi, Japai Tomar chain Vedidi, fit at Manacha Bundi, Bundito, a chain the art kid, or Jerukum Pai Shekul Vede, a rope put the Natskora Noto Tea, was the word for a translation. Can you hear to me? We just shop Duguli translate Portuso, Maskante, Arkitri to me Batsona. Fit at legs means. To me, that's free now. Bundi. That means to me, sense to need to Should you shop do it? Understood now? Yes, sir. Okay. So it's a very nice simile to make us understand. Similarly, Dryden rejects imitation. He also rejected imitation. So he didn't go for word for word, and also he didn't like the idea adaptation. He didn't like it. So where the translator translator uses the source text as a pattern to write as he supposes that author would have done uh, had he lived in a age or in a country. So thing is like that, that when you go for the adaptation or imitation, he's saying that as if the translator actually, he takes the liberty of writing it a new way. And also he thinks that if that writer actually, if you had a, would have done that in our country, in my situation, then he, he would have written it in this way. Bangladesh audience jodhi jodhi likhen, taale, onar e natukta, Russian natukta, Bangladesh উনি সেইটা অনুমান করে ওইভাবে তিনি নিজের মত করে লিখছেন আইডিয়াটা ওখান থেকে নিচ্ছেন কিন্তু মূল টেক্সটের সাথে নাম জায়গার নাম অনেক ঘটনা অনেক কিছু সিচুয়েশনের মিল নেই উনি ওটাকে বাংলাদেশি করে ফেলেছেন লোকাল বা রিজিওনাল যে যে फ्लेভারটা থাকে তিনি সেইটা দেবার চেষ্টা করেছেন মূল টেক্সট থেকে ডেভিয়েট করেছেন অনেক বিচ্যুত হয়ে গেছে বুঝতে পারছেন আমরা কি বলেছি যে আমরা ইমিটেশন যেটা করি ওটাকে অরিজিনাল টেক্সটের হুবহু অনুবাদ করা হয় আমাকে এইটা একটু বলো যতক্ষণ বুঝলাম সেটা আমাকে ব্যাক করো एक्सप्लेन इट टू मी না স্যার ফাইন টেল ইট টেল মি হোয়াট ডিড আই সে ফাইন প্লিজ হোয়াট ইজ ইমিটেশন স্যার হুম ডোন স্যার এটা অ্যাডাপটেশন নট স্যার অ্যাডাপটেশন আউট ফরওয়ার্ড এন্ড অলসো সেন্স ফর সেন্স uh, approach in our idea right no, no, you our tell mind. me about you tell me about adaptation what, is adaptation a, uh, sir, I mean, adaptation is really a translation sir, adaptation means is it really uh, a translation russian adaptation ki actually translation no, sir. adaptation ki no sir tumi eta lekha likla tumi america likho otake ami bangladeshi uh, context e bangladeshi banaye fellam to holo kothay original sir, text bangladeshi amader uh, kache jeta familiar hobe ফেমিলিয়ারিজিনাল <laughs> উনি বলছেন যে ইমিটেশন ড্রাইডেন এর ভিউ উনি বলছেন যে এলাউস দা ট্রান্সলেশন টু বিকাম মোর ভিজিবল এই when actually i adapt okay and if i go for the adaptation that means i have taken a, a text for example a text written by a there is a very famous writer uh, from afghanistan but afghan born but he is an american novelist uh, khaled husaini uh, for example one of his very famous novels and one of his i think this is his first novel uh, the name of the novel is the kite farmer and then also there is another novel, The Splendid Sun. But <clears throat> the Kaitwaner, here you see, in the, uh, the, the Kaitwaner, the situation is, uh, I mean, the plot, or you can see the setting, it is in Afghanistan. And also, uh, some of the part is in America. And when I uh, try to translate this, and if I go for the adaptation, then I will change the whole Afghan situation and I will replace the Afghan situation with Bangladeshi situation. Got it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then it, it, it will no, never be the original. I mean, the whole novel that you change for the first time, it's the whole novel. The whole novel will be copied. So what happens? For example, Khaled Hussain, I mean, still he's alive. But if I translate, uh, if, if I try to translate works from the very famous writers and those who are dead, for example, uh, I'm writing a text for Islam in the last semester, if you can recall, by Ernest Hemingway. What is the name of the text? By Ernest Hemingway. 
টাইমিং Um, the personage that means the <coughs> actress and actresses or you can see the characters they are different and if i try to translate it and if i try to make it bangladeshi and i replace all the names all the situations france spain will be replaced by russia and dhaka so you tell me is it going to be a translation no sir no sir and another thing is that anis having where he is dead so what i am doing i am actually humiliating him i am ignoring his contribution So that's why he says that the the greatest wrong to the memory and reputation of the dead. Well, say it are madhum actually. Amra ekhane dead bolte budha chhe big khato baje kono lekha ok lekhe kajara mara gachhe. Tadhe lekha jekho nijer moto kori ichha kushi bhabe ami ebabe bhavar kuchhi kalpo taake. Well, say ra tadhe jonne ata akuman kora. Ebang tadhe se switi shaitar kuthe amader akuman production kora. Tadhe je khati she khati ke tachil lo kora. That is the greatest wrong. And he says that actually we shouldn't do that because adaptation is harmful. Dryden thus prefers paraphrase, advising that metaphrase and imitation are be avoided. So he says that meta metaphrase that will work for what translation and also imitation and adaptation. These two kinds of translation it must be avoided, but we should go for the paraphrase, sense for sense. Now is it clear to you? Very soon. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great. So we about metaphrase and also imitation. We just choose paraphrase. Okay. <clears throat> Now in the next slide. The triadic model proposes by that means those three uh, uh, metaphrase, paraphrase, and imitation. Those triadic model proposed by Dryden was to exert considerable influence on later writings and on translation. Yet it is also true that Dryden himself changes his stance with the dedication in his translation of Virgil Aeni, showing a shift to a point between paraphrase and literal translation. So you see, Dryden was actually he was in support of meta uh, I mean paraphrase. But later on, actually, when he started translating Virgil's Aeneid, then actually he changed his stand. He changed his, uh, uh, I mean, his his idea about uh, or his support only the his only support for this uh, paraphrase. He didn't he supported paraphrase, but at the same time he also supported literal translation. So now you can see he is trying to amalgamate these two different kinds of translation. one is paraphrase and another one is literal translation okay as fahim at the very beginning of our today's lecture when i asked him the question about metaphrase and paraphrase he said that uh, fahim will support both paraphrase and metaphrase that means there should be a combination of word for word and sense for sense right fahim fahim right, sir so you right, see sir. dryden also did the same in his later part of his career the ক্যারিয়ারের পরবর্তীতে ভার্জিল রেইনিট অনুবাদ করবার সময় তিনি কিন্তু তার যে অবস্থান শুধুমাত্র প্যারাফ্রেজে সাপোর্ট করেছিলেন আগে সেটা থেকে একটু সরে এসে এখন তিনি প্যারাফ্রেজ এবং লিটারাল ট্রান্সলেশন দুটোকে সাপোর্ট করেছেন বলছেন দুটোর কম্বিনেশনে আমাদের কাজ করা উচিত নাও হিয়ার হোয়াট ইজ সেড অ্যাকচুয়ালি হোয়েন হি ওয়াজ ট্রান্সলেটিং দ্য ভার্জিলস এন ইট নাও হিয়ার ইজ হি অর ইন ইট হে সেজ আই থট ফিট টু স্টেয়ার বিটুইক্স দ্য টু এক্সট্রিমস অফ প্যারাফ্রেজ এন্ড লিটারাল ট্রান্সলেশন to keep as near my author as i could without losing all his grace the most eminent of which are in the beauty of his words now it's very interesting now he is saying that i thought fit to stay betwixt the two extremes of paraphrase and literal translation now he is saying that i think that i should move in between paraphrase and literal translation understood what he says betwixt mean between when he bolchen je amar uchit আমি চিন্তা করছি আমি ভাবছি যে প্যারাফ্রেস এর লিটারেল ট্রান্সলেশনের মাঝে মাঝে কি থাকতে হবে বিটুইক্সড এই দুইটা এক্সট্রিম এর মাঝেই আমাকে কাজ করতে হবে ওয়াই টু কিপ এজ নেয়ার মাই আথর এজ আই কিউড দ্যাট মিন্স দেন ইন দ্যাট কেস ইউর ট্রান্সলেশন উইল বি ভেরি ক্লোজ টু দ্য অরিজিনাল টেক্সট দ্য সোর্স টেক্সট অ্যান্ড ইউ উইল ভেরি অ্যান্ড ইন ইউর ট্রান্সলেশন ইট উইল ইট উইল বি ডিমড অ্যাজ এ Uh, I mean, very close to the author. Or the original text or author, which we have been covering, the author is constantly talking about. Whether you are going to paraphrase or literal translation, it is a combination of translation. Translation, what is it? Then only 
মূল যে অথর যিনি ছিলেন যিনি অরিজিনাল টেক্সটটা লিখেছেন তার একেবারে কাঁচা কাছি যাবে তোমার কাজটা and without losing all his graces and if you do so then paraphrase and literal translation if you use both then there is a very less chance that we will lose his graces graces means the beauty the technique the style that he used in the original text the original author that we're talking about that means the author of the source text the way actually he used the style and also the structure and all these things you can also maintain the same so you don't have to lose them all and at the same time the most eminent of which are in in the beauty of his words and at the same time the beauty of the words the uh, i mean the, the original author the way actually he used the words the diction you can also keep the same diction that means the equivalent to your target language so you can maintain that so that's why he's saying that the amalgamation or the combination of paraphrase and literal translation these two extremes and if you can uh, if you can invest that actually while translating a particular work from source text to target target text or source language to target language then in that case you can gain the more and you can be a very good translation in work will be regarded as a very good translation and you can be very close to the original text and also the author understood this um, in the last slide i hope you understand it right do you need any more do you yes, need any sir. more cl clarification anyone ritu lavani no sir yeah. excellent now the description of his own translation approach in fact bears resemblance to his definition of imitation above now this description of his own translation the way actually he is not talking about translation it it sounds like imitation above i may presume to say i have endeavored to make vargil speak such english as he would himself have spoken if he had been born in england and in this present age so you see the problem is that when actually he was criticizing adaptation or imitation uh then uh, he was saying that there is a chance that when we try to adapt or imitate the original text and if you try to write it in our own language so there is a chance that you will deviate from the original text and at the same time it's a kind of insult to the memory of the dead or you can see the dead literators but here when actually he is talking about that i mean combining these two extremes that is metaphrase and paraphrase here you can see it sounds like that he is also supporting the imitation so that is this is a little bit confusing that's why he's saying that i may presume to say i have endeavored to make virgil speak such english as he would himself have spoken now he's saying that ajke virgil jodi beche thakten ami tar anubad korbar shomoy emon bhabe korechi je jeno virgin english bolle ebhabei bolten bojha geche ki bolchi yes sir If he had been born in England, Jodi thi ni England ep John Mogun kortein thale ami thar onu bhatta. Un hobe kore chhi jano Virgil Englishi bolle. If if he were an English, he would have spoken in the same language in the same way, and in this present age. Ebang taadir shi shomay kar onu jai thi ni kotha bol. Thale eta to adaptation er moti huye galu, right? Amra adaptation ni ki kore? Uta amader shomay kar ebang amader ilakar moto kore baniye fili. Amar jailar moto amar desher moto kore baniye fili. जेनरल Dryden and others writing on translation at the time are very prescriptive setting out what he what has to be done in order for successful translation to take place however despite its importance for translation theory Dryden's writing remains full of full of the language of his time the genius of the source text author the force and the spirit of the original the need to perfectly comprehend the sense of the original and the art of translation so look at this his contribution is huge i mean you simply can't ignore him those it it may sounds like self contradictory but it's still that, that it contributed immensely and very much significantly for the development of translation studies in the later later part of the centuries now you see let me explain it let me explain this i mean this dryden and others that means other academicians or the translators or educators what did they do 
most of the time actually they will prescribe. That means that was very much prescriptive. Arthur, you know, okay. Oh, you're breathing very heavily. Who is that guy? Okay, now here we see that therefore Dryden and others writing on translation at the time are very prescriptive. So Tara both in the Kihabilik Tabe, Kamun Kore translation for Tabe, translation theory by style Kamun Habe, Tara Eglu Bolte. Or the Tadir Chulo on a tie, Tara suggests for them, prescribe for them. It was not descriptive, it was prescriptive. Tara both in Jehovah translate for Tabe. Okay, setting out what has to be done in order for success, successful translation to take place. But the successful translation, what they get, key could have a genius group are suggested. Dryden among that from Shamaik Jara translation, the task person, Tadir, it a chulakta way of, I mean, I mean, uh, talking about translation. Taraki could prescribe for them. Data coro, eta coro, eta coro javela translation, never go to have it. So that was prescriptive. However, despite its importance for translation theory, Dryden's writing remains full of language of his time. So it says that, that Dryden's language, I mean, his translation, it's full of, I mean, the, full of the la language of his time. That means he would, I mean, go to that extent that sometimes it may appear that it is a kind of adaptation. So he changed it. And also, he maintained the sense or sense, this idea, this part, uh, I mean, classification, or this trend of translation. He maintained that. And at the same time, you can see the genius of the source, so, uh, source six author. So, he was a very successful translator. You can see that still, actually, he could maintain, he could preserve the genius of the source six author. Source six author is the genius of the talent of the English language. That means to me, source text and author ke, jaha to she Greek language lega the, she ra jakhon dry and translate kore chen uh, English jete. To me she English je lekha ta pore, to me original author ke shampor ke ta dhawan pe the baat je tiri kotha the genius chhe. Ata ta translation ta it was very close to the original text. Among sense for sense, word for word, in both ways actually he was very successful as a translator. To me do toy maintain kore chen tar unubad kaje. She jo ni bolchen je she original text er elegance. Uh, and also the force and the spirit of the original text, everything that actually you can you can find it and the need to perfectly comprehend. So you can comprehend it perfectly, the sense of the original, uh, I mean, uh, in his translation. So the art of translation that he maintained, John Dryden, it was, it was very, you can see it was very, I mean, if you consider his time, it was very modern. I mean, he was in his approach and it was very fruitful and also it was very conducive for us to understand the translation of charges. Uh, uh, right now. Now again, uh, since actually I, I think that we don't have enough time, uh, five more minutes. Will that be okay with you, dear students? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Five okay, minutes. Just, just, for, just five minutes. Okay, after five minutes, we'll finish. <coughs> now here you see other other writers on translation also began to state their principles in a similarly prescriptive fashion. So there are also other writers, they are also prescribing how to translate, what to do when you want to translate. So they're also suggesting. One of the, uh, one of the first had been Etienne Dollet, whose sad fate was noted above in his 1540 manuscript. Uh, it's very difficult to pronounce because it's written in, in their own language. So we'll go for the translation. He said, the way of translating well from one language into another. So this is the name of his writing. principles, translation So let's read those five principles suggested and prescribed by Dolet in his uh, in his text, the way of translating well from one language into another, from this text. Number one. The translator must perfectly understand the sense and mattering of the original author, although he should feel free to clarify obscurities. So the translation prof must perfectly understand the sense and material of the original author. That means he must have a very good command over the language and the material and the sense, the meaning, the intended meaning. 
of the original author. Original author she sends material from the Dharana Thakta, which is At the same time, all the he should feel free to clarify obscurities. And if there is any, uh, if, if there are any obs obscurities, obscurities means any kind of uh, things which are not clarified, which are not clear, which are difficult to understand, confusing, of, 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 uh, or you can say, uh, those are, uh, in Bengali, obscurities means, actually I don't know exactly the word for obscurities, strange, eccentric, so difficult to understand, we call them obscure. Obscure means something which is difficult to understand. Understood? What I'm saying? Yes, sir. Got it? Yes, sir. So a, trans a translator must also clarify those difficulties, those obscurities, obscu uh, obscurities when actually he wants to translate. Second principle, the translator should have a perfect knowledge of both source language and target language, SL and TL, so as not to lessen the majesty of the language, so that when actually he or she will have a very good command over the both languages, the target language and the source language and also the target language, then the majesty of the language, that means the majesty of the source language and also the target language, you can preserve them, you can keep them intact. Bhashar jekta jolu shatana, ekta chakchikko bhavatana pottekta bhashar, ekta charum shundur jatana pottekti bhashar. Yes, sir. So he is saying that Judy Dutu Vashati Amar Judy Shidokota Taki, Tahari Shudamatoshi, a source text, a Jokanavi target language, or about Parachista Goshi, Jolush take a maintain Persian, the majesty of the language, you can preserve it. Third principle the translation should avoid word for word renderings. Translation should avoid word for word rendering. That means he must not go for word for word translation. That means paraphrase. Uh, I mean, uh, metaphrase. You cannot go for metaphrase. That's not a good idea. And also, the translation should avoid Latinate and unusual forms. So, when you translate, he says that you should not use the Latinate, Latinate words, Latinate phrases, or registers. I mean, in your writing, in your translation, because if you keep that, keep those words as the Latin, as the Latin. Uh, I mean, Latin speakers, they would say. If you keep the words or phrases in that way in your original text, then people will find it very difficult to understand because they don't know Latin. You are writing it everything in English, but some of the phrases you just maintained, uh, I mean, the, I mean the, the original text or the source language, you have kept it, kept the words as it is, then in that case, your readers, especially the ordinary readers, they'll find it difficult to understand. So that's why, you must not keep the Latinate or unusual forms of the source text. You shouldn't preserve them. You shouldn't put them in the origin, I mean, in your target language translation. Understood what I've said right right this moment? Yes, sir. Number four, Latinate manote. I mean, you know, I mean, Latin, Roman, language, I mean, 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 for example, what is the English, what is the English for Dheki? Do you want to say English in English? Then what is the English, English for Palki? English equivalent for palki. For example, usually we don't know about this, right? So if there is words which are very uncommon, just like this, then in that case, amra jokhon English the Bangla theke korbe to translate kora, oikhane shobje me dekhi ta ke dekhi rakhi ar palki jage palki rakhi. Bolo to American kinba English je reader ra. Boja adho kisu bujhe je. What is dekhi? What is palki? Then English the equivalent dekhi. D H E K uh, H-I or K-I, Teki, or D-E-D-H-E-N-K-I, Teki. Chandra Bindu Jano Vaskana Teki, Dr. Teki. So, Teki Balki Hono Dekhi Ni Ola. Ola Teta Bujhvei Na, Tomakis Dr. Shetaki Teki, exact to the English word Dathak, then you have to put a footnote, and in that footnote you have to explain that Teki, I mean, it's a kind of instrument that we use to grind stuff. 
which is uh, la just like blender, but it's not exactly like blender. We only grind what? Rice, right? Pedi. Shudhu bato chali to shadon to gura kori. Shudhu the chira banai oni kichu kori. Chalu hangar or joni to amra theke jagar kori. Na ki tomra mango juice kor par joni theke jagar kori. Jo ekjon grinder er kotha bolle. Theke the mango juice kono na ki tomra. फॉर्म्स कोऑर्डिनेशन That, and also, you must be very much eloquent. That means words eloquently to to avoid clumsiness. That means you shouldn't use lots of words to explain a single word. That will bring or that will cause a kind of clumsiness. Clumsiness means it's a kind of jorota, difficulty. Okay, and people will not find it interesting. That is very uninteresting. We call it clumsiness. So you should use words very tactfully, and you must be very careful about your Word vocabulary and uh, and you must be careful about the use of those words. Otherwise, it will, I mean, it will be deemed or it will be recorded as a very clumsy translation. Understood? Got it. So these are the five principles. The translation must perfectly understand the sense and material of the original article. The translation should have a perfect knowledge of both source language and target language. The translation should avoid word-for-word -word renderings. The translation translator should avoid Latinate and unusual forms. The translator should assemble and liaise words eloquently to avoid clumsiness. So these are the five principles. So far, we have got that if you really want to be a translator, you can take these five principles, keep them in your mind, and try to translate accordingly. Okay. Okay, sir. Do you have any question? So I'm just. I open the floor for any kind of question or any kind of observation or suggestion. So, please talk to me. Prima, Prima, sir, can you can you hear me? Sir, you know, past the point, sir, last point is you know the translator should uh, assemble and yes, uh, yes, words. Sir, yes, the man, man, yes, words. Yes, words means they should put the words together. That means they should go for the, I mean, cohesion and coherence. They should, uh, I mean, uh, there should be some kind of coordination. Understood? For example, I'm coordinating with you. If you have any problem, so I'm asking you questions. So I'm coordinating from the department. I'm coordinating with the, all the students, and then I will uh, uh, let the authority about your suggestions and observations. Just like this, so liaise. That means the assemble and liaise. That means you have to assemble words and then you have to put them in right order. Okay, and you have to do it very eloquently. That means eloquent means you, as a good speaker, you have to put them together so that you can avoid clumsiness. Okay. Obviously. All right. Thank you. Sir. You're most welcome. Anything else? No, sir. So, are we good today? It's okay. Okay, sir. All right. So thank you very much, and we'll also continue our discussion about this, uh, about more theories and from from these uh, for from this time, and also in this way uh, afterwards. Actually, we'll come, we'll go to the modern theories, and we'll talk about them in future, inshallah. So thanks for your cooperation and for your patience. I hope you enjoyed it. I also enjoyed your I mean this interactive session, and hope to see you soon, inshallah. So take care of yourself and good day. Thank you sir. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam.